even if it seems like we have been forgotten, God remembers us. God remembers us. Um, if we had our video up and running, uh, we would be showing you a very short two-minute video on the city of Shiloh in our journey through the Old Testament Holy Land places. Shiloh um, became is part of the promised land that the Israelites um, finally became, made their final um, home. It's a land of great beauty and of greenness. It's where the tabernacle um, had its permanent home and was settled. It was here that these events of Samuel took place. Is here is where Samuel was dedicated to the Lord by his um, mother, um, Hannah. Um, it's interesting uh, that it begins with a story of a mother. A story of a mother. So, you know, I think about my faith journey, and if someone said to me, uh, uh, Steve, where did it all begin? I would say, without hesitation, it began with my mother. You know, as kids, mom would say, we're going to church, and we'd go, oh, no, right? But you're going to church. There, there was never a choice. On Sunday, you were to pretty much be on your deathbed. The, the whole faking about you're sick just didn't work. And if you were so sick you couldn't go to church, guess what? When um, 12 o'clock came, you're supposed to be home. It was some miracle cure. You were sick all day by mom's standards. So just like Samuel, um, uh, mom plays a big role in Hannah's story in the birth of Samuel. The whole thing about not remembering um, is very concerning. About a year ago, or maybe longer, we were at some dear friends' um, uh, anniversary at, for, at Friendly Farms, up near, right around the corner from where we lived in Hereford. Uh, Friendly Farms is, is a dinner, home style, sit down, they bring all the food, eat all you want um, type thing. And um, we were being served um, by some young, well, not too young, older teenagers. And they knew me. They kept saying, Pastor Steve, and I didn't know them. And Leslie would walk by, come close, I would say, who are they? Who are they? And she recognized them. I didn't. Um, it's probably been six to eight years since we had seen them. They reminded me that they were in my confirmation class at Hereford. Um, the interesting thing was, in six to eight years, they had changed. I looked exactly the same, right? But they had changed. And that's what happens when we go back. If, you know, we've served up there for over 20 years. We bump into people. Their looks have changed. Mine hasn't, I, you know. Um, and I don't remember. I hate that. I don't remember them. I don't remember them. This is kind of what this story is talking about. Hannah has a feeling in her life, being without child, that she is not remembered. She has been forgotten. Now, the birth of her child, Samuel, um, Samuel is one of the greatest people in the Bible. Um, there's two books of Samuel that shows you how important it is. He, um, he heard God's call. He heard God call him in the middle of the night, Samuel, Samuel, a uh, very familiar story. Um, he was dedicated by his mother to serve God. Um, dedication, um, we don't do a lot of that in the Methodist church. We do infant baptism. But it's the same principle that parents and sponsors come before the body of believers and make an oath and a covenant with the body of believers and with God that they are going to raise this child in the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ. Hannah's was similar. It wasn't in the knowledge and wisdom of Jesus Christ. But Lord, if you allow me to have this child, I will dedicate him to your service. And so Samuel eventually was conceived and was born. He is known through the Bible of great dedication, great trust, great faith in God. He was a multi-purpose saint. He was a prophet, he was a priest, he was a judge, and he was a teacher. He anointed kings and anointed David as king of Israel. He's a wonderful man, just a wonderful man to study. And it's all started back with mom. Isn't that something? So let's jump.
jump into the scriptures. First, let's pray one moment. Father God, thank you for this moment. I ask you in the name of Jesus, let your words be our words and your thoughts be our thoughts that either because of me or in spite of me, you will speak to your children who have gathered here this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The scriptures teach us God remembers us. Now, in verse 1 and 2 of 1 Samuel, it tells us that um, Elkanai um, had two wives. He had a wife called Panetta, and he had a wife named Hannah. Uh, Hannah was the first wife that he wedded with, and uh, Panetta was the second wife. Um, theologians think that maybe he, he married the second time, which was legal custom in his time, because his first wife, Hannah, could not conceive. And the second wife did have children. But Hannah, as the scriptures tell us, um, had a great desire for children. It was such a great desire that her heart was heavy. And, you know, it is hard um, um, to rejoice with others when your heart is broken. It is hard. You know, I'll give you, for example, and um, we are new grandparents, eight months old, and when people would say, um, at least to me, I don't know about Leslie, how great it is to have grandchildren, I'd go, okay, well, that, it's really good that you're joyful. Okay, okay. Um, it did not hit me until our daughter Jennifer walks through the front door, walks past Grammy, grandmom, and hands baby to me and says, here's your granddaughter. That's when it hit me, right? That's when it hit me. A couple, two weeks ago, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when daughter Jennifer, through the baptism process and family, would go through the room and hand her to me, that was something I can't describe. It's something I didn't realize when people talked about their grandchildren. Now, just how much more that is for a woman wanting to have a baby, and then has this rival wife, right, um, who was second in line, um, having multiple children, and then the scriptures in verse 6 says, um, her rival used to provoke her severely to irritation because the Lord had closed her womb. So it, it sounds like Panetta, the second wife, wasn't a kind person. Right? She was a person of pride. Um, maybe she took that at, I am better than you. Um, but the scriptures also tells us in verse 5 that um, Elkanine, the husband, deeply loved Hannah. So he would serve his wife with children, but he would give double portions of food to Hannah because he loved her so much. But you can imagine what people might be saying. For example, you know, people have good intentions, um, but they may be saying to Hannah in an insensitive way, oh, what a blessing it is not to have children, and you don't have to put up with all this, right? Or just think about uh, how much more money you have since you don't have any children. I've said that. I've said that. You know, how, how harsh that must sound to someone who doesn't have children. And the husband in ver verse 8 um, doesn't get it either. Um, verse 8 says, Her husband Elkanine said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? You see, he, he just doesn't get it himself. A friend of mine um, who's a female pastor, and we share sermon ideas each week when we were talking about this, she says, you heard about the study, right? And, of course, this is the female pastor talking. And I say, what study? The study shows that women use both sides of their brains. You know, the whole thing of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And I go, okay. And men use none of it. <laughs> I think that hurts a little bit. That's not true? No. I didn't agree with it either. Yeah. So, um... This is what people say, and we say it because maybe it's like me with grandchildren. I just was not in tune 
to how special that is, and I am not in tune with a woman who may have multiple sisters who have children, and when they gather, how they must feel. Did anyone recognize her pain? Did anyone have sympathy or empathy for her pain? Well, the husband didn't. The husband didn't. It's important for us to hear again that God hears our pain. God hears our pain. Now, let's look what Hannah didn't do. Um, She didn't complain. She didn't follow the principle of misery loves company. I'm miserable, so um, you're going to be miserable too. She didn't do that. She didn't make it her mission to uh, take out her sadness upon anyone else. Or, nor did she clam up and get angry and spray her anger wherever she went. She didn't do that. Now, um, those of you who are married, would you just raise your hand? God bless you all. God bless you all. Here it is. Here's an example. You're driving in the car with your spouse. And you notice it's difficult to breathe. The air is thick. Anybody been there? Don't raise your hand. And the windows are starting to fog up. And you get the courage to say, what's wrong, honey? And the comment is, nothing. And you notice the frost forming on the windows. Right? Or it could be like this, that you take it out on others. The boss yells at you. You come home and yell at your spouse. The spouse spanks the kids. The kids kick the dog. The dog bites the boss who has come for dinner. (laughs) Hannah shows us a better way in verse 9. Well, here's the other problem she had. I mean, it wasn't her problem. Um, Let's talk about poor pastoral care. The pastor, the priest, hears her in her bitterness, in her sadness. And he asks her a question. How much have you been drinking? Can you imagine that? You walk in and say, I'm so sad, and you start crying, and I say... Well, how much have you been drinking? <laughs> she didn't complain. She didn't get angry. She didn't take it out on others. But no one was giving her empathy. No one was giving her sympathy. And what did she do? Verse 11 through 14. She went to the Lord in prayer. She just didn't go say, Oh, Lord God, I would like to have a baby. What 11 through 14 is telling us that she poured her soul out to the Lord. She poured her souls out in such a depth that her lips were moving, but nothing was coming out. Nothing was coming out. So often, the very people we expect to understand our pain don't get it. They don't understand. Have you had that experience? You just wish someone would be in tune with you and offer some empathy. I can sense how much pain you're in, or I can sense how exhausting that might be. But eventually, the priest gets it in verse 17 through 19. Eventually, he sees her pain, and he says, go in peace, and may you find favor with the Lord. What made the difference? The difference was made that she stayed in prayer. You see, when you are telling others about your problem, make sure you tell God. Make sure you tell God. She went to God and poured it all out, and God remembered her. She was without a child for a long time. God wasn't being mean. He hadn't forgotten. It just wasn't the right time. 
It wasn't the right time. And sometimes God says no. God said no to David about his first son born with Bathsheba. And God said no to Elijah when he was tired of being in the ministry. And God said to Paul about removing the thorn. And God said no to me. My first son was born with a brain syndrome and having uncontrollable seizures. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, Lord, take the seizures from him. And I heard nothing from God. Nothing. And then one day, it was on, on um, Holy Thursday, Reverend McNally, my pastor for many years, I was a police officer at the time, called me up and said, Steve, I just heard about Matthew. In my time of prayer, not like we're talking now, but in my time of prayer, a voice I heard whispered in my mind said, Bill, that was his name, Bill McNally, you feed my people, it was communion night, and I will care for Matthew. That's how God spoke to me. Johns Hopkins said he would live to be eight years old. Sometimes if he doesn't straighten up, he's not going to make it the next day. He's now 30-something, 35, 36. Turn with me to um, Matthew uh, 7, real quickly. This, was, this, was my, this is my thing. This is me. Um, Matthew 7. Um, let's see. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find nothing and the door will be open for everyone who asks receive and everyone who searches find and for everyone who knocks the door will be open is there anyone among you if your child asks for bread you would give a stone or if your child asks for fish you would give a snake or if then who are evil know how good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven Give good things to those who ask. I have asked for 30-some years for Matthew. Every day, I ask. Every day. When I was an older teenager, my um, cousin Billy died. Um, we all lived on a farm, and Billy's parents worked, Chuck and Carol, uh, Carolyn worked, and so Billy lived at our house during the day. Of course, home for him was just 100 yards up the hill, the back part of the pasture. Um, he came down with childhood leukemia. Um, Mom was faithful in her prayer. It was like her own child. She prayed constantly. She cried. She wept. She begged God that God would heal Billy he died at age seven with childhood leukemia. Um, uh, when I think about Billy, the only person in the family I remember is my mother. How much she wept and how much she prayed for Billy. Billy was the first child, I understand, or one of the first children at Johns Hopkins to ever receive a bone marrow transplant. I guess he was a pioneer, even though he was lost. And so with Matthew, my son Matthew now with, still has seizures and will never be what you would call normal as a 37-year-old adult, but is managing. Um, my mother who died at 81, I prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her that her cancer would be healed. The Lord took her at 81. Um, and me at 65, um, the thing that reminds me and to give me comfort is that Billy, who died at 7, was not created to live seven years. Matthew, who is now 35, 36, was not created to live 35 or 36 years. Mother, who died at 81, she was not created to live 81 years. Myself, 65, and whenever I live, I am not created to live 65. I am created to live forever. Do you get that? The comfort I have in, in Cousin Billy dying as a little child, he wasn't created for seven years. He was created for eternity. And in eternity, he is made perfect. Matthew, 
was not created to die at 8 or 35 or 70, whatever it is. He is created to live forever, the same with mother and the same with me. Pray constantly. Pour out to God. Believe that he hears you. And remember, no matter how much deep pain you are in or how long or how short your life is, you are not created to live 200 years on planet Earth You are created to live eternity in the kingdom of heaven. That is your home. Rest assured, God has that plan for you. And that is where we will all be who believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Praise be to God.